am recording. Bo hunters, welcome back to another episode. I am very excited. I'm sitting here on Zoom with David Luxford. David, um, I kind of came across you. I actually came across you a few years ago, and a few of my listeners, especially one of my good mates, Adam, that I, I kind of met and um, have become really good friends with because of bow hunting, which we were just talking about before the camaraderie that it builds. But he reached out to me and said, dude, you you need to find this guy. Uh, you need to track him down. I think this is him. And he actually tagged me on your son's Instagram page because you're littered all through it pretty much of a lot of your experiences and pictures and um, things that you guys have done together. And he said, you've, you've written a book, you've um, done all this incredible stuff and very, very confident bowman. And he pretty much said, if you ever can, try to interview the dude because he's a wealth of knowledge. And I was like, done. So that that journey started quite a while ago. And I've been talking with Michael for actually a long time, just trying to make this all tee up. Um, but to be honest, just because of life, it didn't happen as soon as what we wanted to, but it's happening right now, which I'm very excited for. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Matt. So, David, I would like to actually start with, like, how old are you now and when did you actually get into bow hunting? Uh, I'm be 68 in a uh, couple of weeks mm-hmm. and I got into bow hunting 34 years ago uh, through Michael, my son. He was 10 years old and he went over, over the road and played footy one Saturday and all the other kids chased him and tripped him over, took the ball and ran away. And he goes, that's not for me. And our <laughs> posty on the old posty bike, he ran a little uh, bowling club called McAllister Trophy Bowling. Uh, and Michael, I talked to him about it. So I took him over there one Sunday and there's six kids and this bloke sitting around a table under a tree. And we went back and forth. I didn't shoot. And then one day I picked up a recurve and had a shot. And that was it. That was it. <laughs> and it was all over from that point on. And at that stage, I was uh, tied up a safari club, you know, lot that you know, a group in Sydney, and with the ADA and all the other type of caper. And this stuff with the bow and arrow was became insatiable. So, and there's another guy in this wee little tiny triangle. He was a kid up the road. He was 17 or 16. His name is Troy Morris. He's pretty well known across the board now. Great guy. He was mucking around with another mate in the footy oval, firing arrows up in the air and running away, as sometime allegedly I might have even done that. Uh, <laughs> you got to run fast. <laughs> and anyway, so he got ticked off. Somebody told him to come and see me. He knocked on the door and without a lie, since that day I opened the door, we've been best of friends and mm. now he's like in his 50s. And so there's this little triangle of Michael, Troy and I went ballistic. We just went nuts, you know. Uh, you couldn't buy enough old Port Orford Cedars and all that type of stuff. And then we realised they didn't fly very well or were allegedly <laughs> dangerous out of a out of a very old compound. Uh, then we went to the Eagle Greens and all that type of stuff, blah, 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 blah. And we just went nuts. We just – and at that stage, there was you know, a few goats up in the mountains and we had rabbits and you shoot carp and you know, blah, 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 blah. And it just exploded. And there was days – well, you know, Troy would be here eight nights a week. Right, mm-hmm. eight nights a week. Yeah, you know, he just live up there and be happy tooting, driving past his place and he'd be around. And if I wasn't going up the mountains with Michael, you know, Troy would take him up and blah. It was just the best time. And then I got seriously involved with the McAllister Trophy Barners. Uh, I brought that up to a pretty, you know, good, solid club. And it just kept growing and growing. But with this connection to Safari Club, at that stage, they had a big award called the Alford Award, which was for the 15 uh, trophy species of the South Pacific. So mm-hmm. I was going, I'm going to get that thing. <laughs> and anyway, At that time, do you know how many people had done it? Uh, there's a few had done it. But this was with gun or gun flamethrowers, grenades, who cared, you know, like, <laughs> didn't matter. So Had anyone anyway, done it with the bow yet? No, 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 nobody ever done it with the bow. So 
Anyway, I had only a couple of species to go and reshoot a couple. And so but with that, I was tied up with an outfitter, Mark, uh, Mick, Kevin Mick McCormick, South Pacific uh, Safaris. And with that, I met a lot of Americans, was a bit here, there, everywhere, and all that type of stuff. And it was just the best, wildest time. But in a part of that, one day, right, because our club was starting to grow, a chap by the name of Keith Goldsmith, he came over. I didn't really know him, I heard of him. And he put this shirt, you know, all ABA stuff, uh, a shirt with badges on my kitchen table. And I looked at this shirt and it had all these animal badges on it. And I go, how do you get them? And he goes, well, this, 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 this. And I go, I'm going to get a shirt like that. Now, and then I stopped the pursuit of the 15 South Pacific trophies with Safari Club. And I go, well, I'm going to do that <laughs> in Australia. So, and that then took me on the greatest journey you can ever imagine, you know, mm -hmm. and in association with the McCormicks, right, you'd be, they'd ring up and go, be in Darwin at such and such, you know, on Thursday or be in Cairns, we're going to New Guinea or blah, 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 blah. And I used to go along as a Skinner boy, Skinner boy, Skinner boy you know, uh, bottom of the food chain, you know. <laughs> and anyway, had the best and wildest times. And at that stage, even Ben's back, which is probably, you know, you were probably still in kindergarten or maybe even born. And that that, that was with the uh, team of Roy, Team Marie's Rusa. So we were on a buffalo hunt, you know, a cull at Weewak, and that was wild, insane as it was. And then we flew back across, you know, with these Americans, and I had me bow, and all these Rusa and all that type of stuff. And it was just, just the burst. You're just <laughs> involved right across, and you're aware of everything that was going on, and you're aware of outfitters, you knew different outfitters and whatnot. And when I shot my Bang Tang in 96, I think it was, 94, 96, uh, that was solely due to I knew that a, one of the outfitters had to get rid of uh, some tags because, you know, the season was running out and they always pay up front for the tag. Anyway, so I went along on that and it was, <laughs> it was one of the few occasions that I was deadly honest with my wife about the cost of these – extravaganzas <laughs> yeah anyway so, so i went up there and very memorable uh there's a chap by the name of bob easterbrook yeah he was friends with you know, some of the old legends he was an american guy uh the old legends and stuff like that you know uh of the of the uh, blokes who had you know made eagle um you know, you know arrows and all that type of stuff yeah anyway so and he had he had a uh, one of them funny bows uh, looked like a recurve on steroids, but it was actually a compound. I can't even remember the name of it. Anyway, anyway, so and I had bare bow, yeah. right? And so he had pins and all this type of stuff. A nig, a needer eagle. That's what he had. And anyway, uh, I'd never seen one. And yeah, we're having a couple of shots, and, and I was quite you know intimidated by the presence of this you know, guy who knew everybody had read about. Yeah. And so away we go. And so, yeah, I'm shooting an anthill with me. I think it was me 2219s with a javelin, which was the old Davies javelin, which is way back before Tuskers and all this type of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had these flying crowbars with four or five-inch feathers and, you know, and fingers and away you go. But – uh <laughs> It was pretty amazing because I killed one and he didn't. Oh, that was pretty cool. Anyway. Yeah, wow. So, but that's all of a sudden you go way back with stuff and then you just kind of get caught up in a bit of a treadmill of great people, great things. And you would have heard of Billy Baker. Mm -hmm. uh, you heard of him, of course? Yeah, yeah, I've heard the name. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 He, he was a legend in his, in his, in his lifetime, you know, big time. And, I met him, you know, very early in the piece. And Michael was probably 10 or maybe about 12. And he, Billy was uh, living at Jindabyne up in the mountains on the snowy. Mm -hmm. And anyway, we got on well. And he goes, bring Michael up. So I just borrowed a bow, you know, like 
this is how naive I was about the whole gig. And it went up and Michael shot a goat and whatnot. And that interaction with Bill taught me a lot of little total fundamentals, which I still pass on to people who are going, say, for instance, you know, when do I, when do I shoot? How do I know when to shoot? Why do I go? Be patient, be patient. The shot should present itself. Not always, but it should. It should Wait yeah. for that presentation of the right shot. Don't don't be impatient and go, oh, I'll stick one, you know, I'll just stick one into it, you know, <laughs> um, and all, all that type of stuff. So, so those things, that association with Bill, then took me to Toomba, which is, you know, kind of famous in the mining world of things with the chittle and, and pigs and whatnot. So I was up there with Bill in 91 or whatever, a year or two before he started the safaris and that, you know, and, you know, had the best time. And, and we did a lot in the mountains together and all that type of stuff. But his, that association with people and what you learn from some of them people who are, are good and decent and believe in the spirit, the spirit of the arrow, the spirit of the hunt, the spirit of ethics and all that type of stuff has can have great influence uh, that's long lasting. And with that connections or experience with them people, I really do feel then it's then your responsibility to do the best you can to pass on and be as helpful as, as, as you can. Now, Definitely. if, except, except with, Technical stuff, right? <laughs> technical stuff. So before, I have a. I was going to say sorry. before we go too far down that route, can you talk more about the spirit that side of things? Like, I think the, the whole foundation of this podcast has always been like, I'm I'm a beginner. I'm going to learn as much as I can and take as many people with me as I can. Um, and it's it's now four years on, um, and I think I've learned a lot. But at the same time, whenever I hear something a bit more down that route, it really actually spikes my ears quite a lot. So. Can you unpack what you mean by the spirit of the arrow, the spirit of the arrow, spirit of the animal, spirit of, yeah. Okay. Uh, probably not to digress too far, but when I was doing that bow hunting book, which was started for, I don't know. I don't know. I had, I had no authority to whatever to, 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 to write stuff, but it wasn't a how to or anything like that. Now at the very end in the epilogue, right, everything came to being and came to prominence of understanding what that super long journey was all about to take all the species. Mm -hmm. The last species was a hog deer. Now, I'd hunted hog deer for a long, long, long time, averaging 100 plus hours sitting in trees, la, 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 or, <laughs> yeah, almost every day. Yeah. And I shot a hind, right, and to a total different kind of concept of hunting. And the sadness about that was that the next morning I didn't have to go. I didn't have to think about it. And I kind of felt very empty. Mm. And the next day it was raining. I got up and I went down and I sat in my tree once more in the rain and it dawned on me what the whole journey was all about and it was about being there. It was, I could still smell the rain, the wet bush, the wet soil. And I sat there and had animals walking around and whatnot, all within arrow range and whatnot. And I sat there and I thought, this is what it's about. And it was a really super bing, the light goes on in your head moment of this is the game. This is what it's about. It's not you know, about grasping a big set of antlers, although it is to a degree, but it's about being there and being in, like, say, getting back into the whole, say, spirit of the hunt, being within an animal's personal space when you can look in his pupil or his or hers or whatever it may be, but being that per personal space and you have won the day, you have beaten that wild animal and you have got within 15, 20 metres and like I'm no crack shot, you know, at all. But I like, I've got to get in close, you know. <laughs> so that art of closeness and one of my 
greatest animal experiences. And in that book, there's a picture of me with a little fellow spiker. And I had a few, yeah, criticisms about, oh, you haven't shot much. It's a little wee little spiker, you know. But that fellow deer was uh, up near Goulburn in the Bald Hills or the Black Range. You know, it was all open. And I see this animal and I go, I wonder if I could get to that. And it took hours and hours. There was not a thistle. There was nothing, nothing. But I ended up shooting that deer at 20 metres. It was the classic impossible situation. And that is what it's about. Mm-hmm. And like, like you know, and, and the spirit of the whole thing is, and even in this modern time when there's a lot of, you know, and sites change everything. And, and like nearly everything in that book was taken, or all them animals were taken bare boat. You know, like, and in the end, I put, you know, I'd have 2315s with heaps of feathers on them and, you know, a finger tap, like with a couple of crappy little sights. <laughs> and so there was only a couple of animals taken with the pins. Uh, and that's really, uh, I didn't emphasize that that was really the game because that was just the game. That's just what you did. That's all you had, you know, you just mm-hmm. kind of, but, and so that spirit, getting back to the say, the spirit of the arrow, and it's about, you know, doing everything you can with that arrow. And sometimes it doesn't work. We all know that. You'd be a liar if you said it, you know, everything was done. But, but, but you've given this weapon or you've chosen this weapon. And there was a book written by a, a Spanish guy, Why Guess It? It's called The Meditations on Hunting. Absolutely powerful reading, very mm-hmm. difficult, but powerful. And he talked about uh, the more technology advances, right? So you got lasers or whatever, you got all this other stuff. The further the gap widens to be a hunter, right? Mm-hmm. So the technology runs this way, la la la. So the gap just becomes incredible. Like, you know, what well, computerized scopes and whatnot to shoot something a thousand meters. Who cares? You know? Uh, but, and so really to be in the spirit, you know, close to the definition of a hunter, you know, really it's the stick bow guy, right? Mm. Uh, is as close as you can get. Uh, recurve, next guy, mm, compound, next guy. And even that whole thing about the compound, which again, you know, depending on which side of the fence you play, trad or compounds or whatever, I still have to do pretty well what the stick bow guide has to do. I got to get in close. And it's about that uh, minimization of a poorly placed shot, mm-hmm. uh, is, is to me what the compounders are all about, you know, and you still miss. I have blah, 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 blah. But you go, boom, I'm going to do my best. And this machine, has given the technology associated with that machine has given me the opportunity to still do everything else that you have to do. And that's, you know, the crawl, whatever, whatever, whatever. But the end result placement is to me, you know, a a fairer way, a more respected way to deal with the end result that you're going to have hopefully at your feet, you know. So that spirit is about connection with the animal. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, that connection with the animal then is associated with the spirit of the arrow because that's why you're there, you know. And then the whole biggest side of things is is that whole why you're there. You're there to find beautiful animals, smart animals, to outsmart them, whatever, and have that personal connection when you can stare into their eyes. And, and one of my – got a few things hanging up and – in my trophy room, Just a few. <laughs> uh, and one of them is like a, a small fallow deer, right? And eh, probably 130 or Douglas points or whatever, right? And that is my one of my favourites because, but he was in with his hinds in a 20 meter patch of ferns, and I eventually got into that patch of ferns. So he's grunting and running around, chasing the hinds, fighting the spikers and the you know, the little fringe dweller stags, and then he'd serve his hinds and then fight another thing and whatnot. And I sat for over half an hour in that same 20 metres of ferns with this guy and his and his hinds. And eventually 
Yeah, he just walked past me at about 15 metres, and I go, well, you've, you know, you've done your business. I've been watching you quietly, you know, not not, not in a perverse manner, but, you know, <laughs> looking away, going, yeah, well, you've, you know, you fixed her up, away you go. And then I shot him. But it was all about being in that personal, absolutely personal situation with that little fellow deer, you know, mm-hmm. and going, never forgot it, and that was – Maximus, Maximus, you know, the greatest thing. And, and it's like all the interaction with foxes and I do a fair bit of that, you know, and that's pretty cool. Uh, I love it. But the game is the closer, the closer, the closer, the closer, how close, you know, can I get to yeah. you and all that type of stuff. And, and I do have a great passion for goats and that as well. But, uh, yeah, so to me that spirit of the arrow, that and it was Flying through, and we all know that if you go to somebody's house or somebody's shed or whatever, 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 or you knock on their door, two things either happen. One, you click or you don't. And if you click, you got a friend for life because you're playing on the same page and you believe in the same things. You don't have to explain what you do, but mm-hmm. you just click because you know. You know, yeah. you just know. It's pretty cool. I hope yeah. that explains it. No, it definitely does. And it's funny because um, I've always been really big on the, the meditative side of archery in general and, and what hunting has done for me, but I also know for many other men and the mindset that it gives us. And realistically, my wife loves it when I go out hunting because I come back a better man for it, right? Like you come back and your cup, your cup is completely full. I'm there. And although I'm completely wrecked from the time of being away, I'm so excited because of the the journey that I've just been on. Whether I've come back and been successful or not, it doesn't matter because it's completely filled my cup and it's it's made me hungry to go out and do it all again. Um, and I think bow hunting in general, it does a lot more for us than just providing meat or just providing a memory. And yes, that's some of the greatest things of it, but there's a lot more to it that sometimes just can't necessarily be explained. I think the spirit is it kind of explains it a lot more in detail. Yeah, yeah, and and that that whole thing about uh, meat on the table, like. I, I said to one guy one day, you know, he was harping on about stuff and he was a bit of a whatever. And I go, if you want meat in the table, mate, like you can buy a side of lamb for 30 bucks down the butcher <laughs> shop, you know, like that'll solve it. But with that, you're saying coming back and your cup's full. I had a friend, he was a high flyer, right? And the only time he totally relaxed was when we would be in the bush he, you know, it was kind of like eighty mm, percent of the bows. We take a bow and we go looking for goats up in the mountains, and we would sit on logs, which I, you know, call them conversation logs. You know, they don't have a sign on them, but you know, every log has the opportunity for a good conversation. Uh, and he would totally relax, and it's the only time, the only mm. time where, and we both know that. When you go over the bush, whether you're chasing rabbits or whether you're whistling or whether you're sitting in a tree stand for something, your head, all the troubles of the world or whatever, whatever, whatever is gone because you're focused on one thing, Mm -hmm. one thing, honey. And that cannot be given the same uh, basis if you're a bushwalker or a tramper or whatever you want to call them because – What's the point of just walking? Why are you going to go to the bush and walk? Why not carry? Why not carry a weapon? You know, uh, I don't get the bush walking, but you go and do the same stuff. But you know, with a bow over your shoulder, and uh, yeah, and it's just that kind of fulfilment. And mm. and I didn't come from a hunting family or nothing like that uh, at all. But every now and then, you know, you just kind of like start scratching the put, you know, pouring the dirt, and you go, I got to go. I got to go, and you got to go, and mm-hmm. away you go. And exactly what you said, you go. I got to go. Doesn't matter whether you're loading something back or whatever, or whether you've missed, or whether you had a shot, or whether you had a you know muffed stalk. But it just doesn't matter. It's seriously being there, uh, and that being there, right? Uh, last year, and this is an example of the greatness of everything. Last year I was up in the territory doing some skinning and whatnot. And anyway, at a buffalo camp, yeah. And there's a day spare. So everybody had gone and waiting for the new guys to come in. So I go for a stroll. And what we see 
as as hunters it, it, it far exceeds what any person in the Winnebago or, or tourist or, or whatever will ever, ever, ever see or understand. So I went for a stroll up this bit of a dry creek river, a bit of water in it. And, yeah, within an hour, you know, I played with a couple of hogs, took some photos of hogs, shot a couple of hogs, uh, walked around a couple of nasty, intimidating scrub bulls, uh, stepped back in from a you know, big stallion with his mares and he was kind of dancing around, you know, shadow punch in the air, you know, uh, come across buffalo that would just, you know, their beady eyes are poking out of the water, you know, and, and, and walk around donkeys, you know, and, and this hour or two stroll, I'll never forget it. And I go, at this point of time, one, nobody knows where you are. They got a bit of an idea, you know, uh, and two, this is as wild as you could ever imagine because, and defined by the fact that these super wild animals, that was their block. And mm. you were walking down the main street of their little town. You are in the wild. Stuff like that, that's what gives us great solace, mm. uh, adds to the spirit of everything uh, and reinforces why we do it? We're somewhere where the ordinary guy, the guy sitting beside you in the office on Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever, he doesn't know that shit, you know, yeah. or on Monday around the coffee table or the water, the water thing or whatever. What that person done for the weekend may have been seriously exciting to them, but it could be just so boring, so <laughs> tedious to us uh, because we have done something that you can't explain. Mm. to them you go actually i didn't know where i was you know, even say in the mountains around here or whatever or i got lost in a huge manuka patch or i've been going through canes that i just didn't know and and with that whole thing about how you can actually learn from people uh 11 years ago i took a 10 year old out and he <laughs> he was a character right and he I'd got him, uh, he wanted a, to use a Mongolian horse bow, as you would, <laughs> as you would, right? So I go, that's a super challenge, right? <laughs> Take a 10-year-old out, out chasing rabbits and that with a Mongolian horse bow, right? Without the horse, without the horse, right? Yes, yeah. We might have had a better chance. Anyway, so, and we're, we're going through these canes and all that. Uh, and, and then we go through that. Didn't know where we're going. Uh, I knew, kind of, we just got to go through them. Uh, but it was like going into an insane jungle. And then we had to go through this huge manuka patch, right? And I don't know if you know them little jewel spiders, they're little kind of pretty things, little fat spiders. Yeah. And there's millions of them in some places. And the webs, and I, so I got a stick just kind of knocking the webs down as we're walking through. Now, this young fella, right, thoughtful boy, he said to me, he goes, you know what, David? He goes, Bow hunting, unlike target stuff, teaches you courage. <laughs> Blew me away. Yeah. Blew me away. Yeah. And at his 21st, two weeks ago, in a little speech, I said exactly that. You know, never forgot that because it does. And we don't mm -hmm. think about it. You don't it. realize it. Yeah. You don't realize it. Because even like another guy, his brother, I took him out of it. Right. So we're going down through this stuff and it's a hot day. Tiger snake country, swamps, and we go and drop down in this bit of a little gully. Yeah, you know, it's about 60 metres of canes and reeds. So I'm just walking through, crash, crash, crash. And I stopped in the middle of them and I said to him, have you been thinking about tiger snakes? And he, <laughs> and with a, a quiver, a quiver of his lip, he goes, not until now. Not until now. <laughs> but... But that's what it does. Mm -hmm. And that's, that building of, of inner strength for young people, they don't realise that it's happening or they don't realise that this is an evolution of your, your own personal spirit mm. that you can develop as a human, as a parent, youth or whatever, that you are totally, unlike a lot of stuff, you, know, you, you can kind of give all excuses why you do stuff, but in the bush by yourself, 
becomes paramount that you are responsible for your own actions. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be a dick in the bush, well, bad luck, you know, and all, all that stuff, all that type of stuff. Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> no, I love it. And it, it really does. It builds a resilience. And I'll often say um, most bow hunters you come across, you're typically going to get along with most of them because it weeds out all the dickheads anyway, just just in the sense of what they have to go through to, to get into bow hunting and stay in bow hunting. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get along with all of them, but it's a fair filter to start off with. That's for sure. It is a fair filter. And yeah, and, and that's like I said before, if somebody knocks at the door, you might get on with them and you don't. And that's, that's no different. Like, I go to Red Deer Camp every year, and there's mm, 20, 24 hunters over a three-week period. Get along with all of them. But some, you'll pop around for a cup of tea, and some yeah. you won't. Yeah. You know? 100%. But you get along with everybody because you're saying on the play, same play, playing on the same page. Uh, and and, and that, that that just happens, and that's no different than anything we do as, yeah. uh, you know, in social social aspects. You know? So um, taking it back to – going after all of the Australian species, what, what twigged that to start with? Was it the badges? Essentially, that was what was the big thing of to, Hey, I could, I could do this. Yeah. Yeah. Ex no, exactly. Cause I didn't know half the stuff was even out there. <laughs> and, and I was accused, right. Uh, a couple of times by people who I thought judged me poorly, uh, that I was a badge collector. Right. Mm -hmm. And you go, well, I guess I am. I'm gonna I'm gonna get these damn things, these three dollar fifty badges, so I'm on my shirt. <laughs> right. Uh but what they never realized was that okay, take a donkey badge, right? I did days, like at that stage, I didn't know whether we'd finish our hunt like on Melville or whatever, and I'd have a day's finish off skins and then half a day. I go look around stuff, la 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 la. And and the same thing, this is old bear bow day. And then eventually, and then Burroughs and I were in the West, uh, chasing camels, and I missed a couple of donkeys there, whatever. And then I was at another station doing stuff up in the goal. And this guy goes, Oh, you know, like give this guy a ring. So anyway, you know, after whatever, we'd go back there and eventually shoot a donkey. But in the journey to get that $3.50 donkey badge, I had been in insane places mm. and sat in insane play places as well yeah. and met some beautiful people that that journey would have never happened no. without that so-called badge collecting. And it's even like the sawfish. Man, I spent a lot of time when you could, when you know we, we recognize swordfish and whatnot. Um, I think it was a total of 44 days over a period of three or four years in the mm -hmm. water, right? Trying to get swordfish, damn it, they were hard to find, you know, <laughs> and all and all that stuff, they were very tricky. Uh, so that side of it, that person or the people who judge me on that didn't actually get it, and then even. Like, I used to wear my badges in bad shirt, you know. People call it, oh, I'm a hunter shirt, you know. Uh, and you'd go, no, I wear that because I worked really super, super, super hard. And it took like decades, a couple of decades and plus to get. But what I loved about it, that you'd always get kids stand, you'd feel some kids standing behind you looking, you know. And you go, so how do you get them? And I go, well, this is how we do it. <laughs> what would you like to, what would you like to get first i go i think we should get a rabbit you know and away you go and if that encourages that young fella you go oh, i'm gonna get a rabbit badge and if that's what it needs who cares no yeah, matter definitely. what you know so that side of it that was the spirit that really fired me go i'm gonna get them i'm gonna get them all you know and never realizing that it would be such a long drawn out task full of mega disappointment mm -hmm. uh just mega effort just <laughs> disappointments beyond beyond comprehension like even when i shot my first samba right which was going back you know uh, 25 years ago uh i was obsessed badly 
by that mission and at that stage one had an antlered samba had never been recorded with the association and i knew another guy was out there he was gonna go have a crack and i go i'm gonna do it but it was bad and i remember sitting in a tree one night going i could not remember when i was at home on the couch with the kids and i drive like two hours like i was consuming 250 dollars worth of fuel mm. a week i'd was gone and even at 11 o'clock at night i'd go out front and have a cup and a fag and i go oh it's naughty blown i would be gone and get to where i was going but after one swag it be there daylight in my tree da 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 and sometimes sometimes sadly i get in the morning i go was it suddenly blown no good i'd come home absolutely absolutely bad michael remembers because he was i don't know whatever he was 14 or something like that at the time he had 50 and you go, yeah, it was a dangerous obsession. And mm-hmm. eventually I shot one and and I didn't go back uh, until like a few years ago when I got the bug again, you know, but not as bad because – and when the, when the other guy shot one, you know, a little stag, I was so happy for him. I was mm. so happy because all of a sudden I was free, you know, yeah. and another time in that, <laughs> in that tray, right, I real I was still like that stage tied up at Safari Club a bit, right? And they used to have a thing called the Australia Award, right? So every convention, any annual convention, that people would send in their you know so called claims or applications that animals they shot, and then the meeting would vote on what they deemed was the best trophy, right? So anyway, I knew, I knew that you go, oh, and they they didn't have like. Right, if they had bronze statue, you know, bronze statues, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, huge things. And I was fortunate enough to get a couple of them before, but I knew that I could get another one, right? <laughs> so, uh, if I shot a salmon deer, you know, uh, yeah, an antler deer, I knew, I knew they'd go, oh, yeah, it's, it's great, blah blah blah. blah. Anyway, <laughs> so they, and I was sitting in this tree one night. And because sitting tree standing is an art, it's tough. It's mm-hmm. tougher than stalking. Mm-hmm. Uh, mentally, it can be debilitating yeah. because you've got plenty of time to reflect on yourself. And you go, and you go, I'm a loser. I shouldn't be here. I'm just wasting time I'm sitting in a tree. You know, what am I doing? Being a koala bear or something. Anyway, so I'm sitting there and it dawned on me. I went, I'm bronze. I don't, that's pretty funny to say this to you without realizing that a lot of people might listen to this. But anyway, anyway, I go, I'm bronze hunting. And it was, I got down out of the tree. This is hour before dark. And come on. It was another one of them being that wrong. You sh- no, this is not how it is, David. Down mm-hmm. out of the tree, go home. Boom. That's how it is because that you realize that you're driven by, uh, I don't know. I don't know. What it's, almost, you know. it's almost ego, isn't it? Right. By that. Oh uh, yeah. 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 Oh, you go, I'm going to get a, no, a whole nother one. thing. Go, Hey, suckers. I've got another one of your rifle guys. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> and the great thing about that at that time, uh, bowing within the safari club was, wasn't there. You know, I was the kind of first one who, without doubt, not the first bow hunter in there, but uh, all of a sudden I was putting these animals into their award things and I was winning because they didn't really know. They were kind of like 357, 600 Nitro boys, you know, and you go, oh, I got one of them with a very sharp stick. You know? <laughs> so it was an awakening for them and it was, a pretty powerful moment at that stage to be addressing black tie dinners and politicians and talk about bows and arrows. It was uh, more powerful than I ever thought, actually. You know. But anyway, anyway, anyway. But that, so that whole, obs- well, I don't know how it got onto this, but yeah, that whole obsession <laughs> thing to go, what am I doing? I'm doing it, doing it wrong. And it's no different than New Year's Day this year. I went out New Year's Day after a fox because I'd done that every New Year's Day. If 
for like 25, 27 years, every New Year's Day. No, got to go back, got to go back. You know? And I didn't have the fox spirit, the spirit of the fox or whatever in me. And I went out and I, and I, yeah, whistled one up. And then I go, yeah, yeah, it's just not here. He didn't come in for a shot anyway, but. I go, no, 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 no. So this year for the first time, normally in January, February, I'll go out eight times a week. No mm. kidding. I just go, 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 go. This year, go, no, nah, boom. You know, you haven't got it. It's not firing. You're not firing. And I got a heap of other stuff on anyway. But uh, I went, no, nah, no, nah, you go when you know. And Graham Duff, the great Graham Duff, the greatest fox shooter ever, 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 ever in Australia with a bow and arrow. He once said, if you haven't got it in your veins to kill something that day, don't go. Mm. Because you go, you're going to be half-hearted about it. And he said, right. You go down and go, I'm going to kill a fox. Blight, gotcha, old sunny boy. You know? Where if you're kind of like, yeah, it's like, could be like uh, shooting an animal because you should shoot it, but you don't really want to, but maybe it's expected of you, but you don't want to, you don't care, or you go, I'd rather let it walk away or whatever, whatever, whatever. And you end up firing a shot almost uh, against your will. And generally it doesn't work and yeah, it goes to, happens. goes yeah. to custard. Yeah, yeah, you go, whoa, that's you. I'm glad nobody's watching me, filming me, you know, or whoa, whatever, or whatever. It's not on Instagram, you know. <laughs> so anyway, 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 sorry. No, it's yeah. interesting. Um, and I really had like a bit of an aha moment um, because I was really pressuring my hunting a lot when I very first started. I'd say probably even the first two, two and a half years of my hunting, I had this mass amount of pressure, this weight that I was carrying on my shoulder where I had to be successful. And I'd go and things wouldn't be successful and I would just beat the crap out of myself and mentally. Um, and it was just like, yes, there were things that it did come together for me within that two and a half years, but more often than not, I would come home and be really disappointed with it rather than excited with the journey that I had. So disappointed with the outcome rather than thinking about what the journey was. And one time my wife said to me, are you happy that you went? I said, oh, hundred percent. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm very happy that I went. It's just, that I'm very task driven right now. And I wanted, I wanted to get a result and I haven't got the result yet, but it also made me realize like, this is something that I've now adopted and I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Like I want to be like you when I'm 68 or when I'm 78 and I'm walking the hill still and getting out with my bow. That is definitely a big focus of mine. So it was the transition of mindset of if it doesn't happen today, that's all right because it's going to happen. And this is something that I've now adopted for the rest of my life. Like bow hunting is just something I'm going to do. I just know it is because it's something that's just, it's just ticked with me so well. Um, like you said, it becomes an obsession, something that almost takes over every bit of thinking power that you've got. Um, but for me, that transition, that was a, a really profound moment because then I took the pressure off of my hunting and I started to enjoy the moments more and became more appreciative of every moment that I was out in the bush, even if there weren't animals about me, like animals, I'd say animals that you can shoot, for instance, like there's still birds, there's still insects, there's still the cattle, there's still kangaroos and wallabies and whatever else that that's about. And all these extra moments that you can kind of take in and go, wow, this is really truly incredible. And that appreciation that I, that transition that I had gave me so much more appreciation for what bow hunting was as a journey. It's like the spirit that you're talking about essentially. Um, and that was, that for me was a very profound moment in, in bow hunting in general. It kind of, it was kind of like, not necessarily, it was, it was almost like the, um, what do they call it? Like the walkabout or like the, um, the, the, I'm trying to think of the word. Almost like the rite of passage of bow hunting essentially for me. And it didn't, didn't take me having to kill an animal for that to happen. It was a mental shift more than anything. Yeah. And that, a uh, couple of things you said there, that expectation mm -hmm. of going out and, and uh, peer pressure, uh, wanted to be seen by you know, your friends or your peers as being successful. 
uh, and I see, you know, the problematics of uh, social media, social media uh, which, you know, like mightn't be that well known, but I'm the president of the Luddites Association of Australia. If you don't know what a Luddite is, they're people who are opposed to change, you know. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, I've never sent a text, okay, boys? I've never sent a text. And on the side of my coffin, it's going to be, this man never sent a text. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but that that is it's the same with the social media thing, is that I want to be seen, I want to be seen, or, or I've got to have another one, I've got to have another one. And years ago, some famous American bow owner, he was uh, buying, getting sponsors, 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 and his sponsorship drove him that hard that it drove him, drove him, over the fence into Yosemite, or I think it's Yosemite, isn't Yosemite, it? <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Yeah, the Yosemite, and that's when it all went to custard for it. Mm-hmm. But that was driven by, and that, so and and because, uh, and I've seen it, you know, over the years here, uh, and I find it a bit sad that, uh, w- w- with with the bow, the old days, you'd go to the archery club, the archery club, you know, blah 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 blah, and you'd be punching arrows, punching arrows. To get proficient, where we all know they'd go to the sports store, spend a few bucks, you can be proficient within 20 minutes with a compound with sights. Boom. Mm-hmm. I've done it. Taking blokes out and go, right, okay, this is a gig. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and you go, well, now I see the problem that, you know, where before it was rabbits, 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 goats, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and then getting back to that 15 species of South Pacific, Samba deer sat on the top. They were the top. They were yep. the top. You know? yep. Rifle, whatever, whatever. They were on top. Where now people are getting a bow and going Samba hunting. You go, no, pull back. Pull back. you got to do, isn't, isn't there an apprenticeship or whatever? Because it's all the other things. <laughs> the hierarchy of animals. Yeah. Yeah, the hierarchy. You go, yeah, you go, no, you got to do this because this is a big, powerful animal that can carry a wound, can carry this and whatnot, and you haven't shot anything. You don't even know how to blood trail or this or that. You go, whoa, it's probably not going to be a great experience. Uh, and which then leads to, you know, the disappointments that you're talking about or the frustration if you come home and you go angry, you're a tosser, you're a loser, you go, blah, 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 blah. but you know, with that little bit of, uh, you know, say experience, a few notches on your belt, well, then you go, that well, you said, but write a passage or whatever. You go, right, you know, now I'll go and uh, have a crack at the best. Or it's like going and playing with buffaloes or scrub bulls. You go, yep, got to play hard and you got to know a little bit of bit of stuff. But that, and, and, and see, like, uh, what have I said before, but in that, that bow book, one guy said to me one day, he goes, you missed a lot of things, which I thought was a bit harsh. <laughs> right. And I said to that guy, I go, uh, actually, I didn't need you to tell me that because my mother told me that. And and then he said, but you got close to a lot of things. And then another bloke said, he said, I always thought this is getting back to coming back empty-handed, empty-handed, empty-handed. This other guy said that when he read that, he said, I always thought that you and Burroughs just went and got stuff. He said, it wasn't until I read that I realized you didn't. Mm -hmm. And that had a changing thought process for him, Mm -hmm. that it's okay to go and go and go again and spend the money, whatever it is, you know, and keep going. And even many years ago, 26 years ago, I'd had a bad run on the foxes. I'd missed 11 in a row. I'm laying on the couch one afternoon, you know, at the time I'd normally go, and my 11-year-old daughter said to me, are you going, Dad? And I said, no, I've missed 11 in a row. I'm a loser. And she said, you will only be a loser if you stay on the couch. Mm-hmm. Profound words. Go off the couch, went out, missed another one. But, <laughs> but that didn't matter because I – Never forgot that. That's the, the mindset right. shift. And, yeah. and, and even before in amongst you know, the stuff you're saying is that uh, I mean, a few years ago, I was up in Chittle and whatnot again, and uh, everything was going pretty well. Mm-hmm. And I go, right, didn't maybe feel like going out, didn't really have a plan, but I thought I'm going out 
to create opportunity. And that has stayed with me pretty well. And even like uh, the other week, I was back up in Amber in the mountains or whatever on the, on the Samba and whatnot. And I uh, was pretty carefree about everything. And I go, what we do is we go for a stroll. Because in that process of going for a stroll, we are creating an opportunity. Right down on the bottom line, but we're already out there. Anything can happen. Any, and you might totally, once you're, once you're moving or whatever, all of a sudden everything clicks into gear and all of a sudden you go, right, this is what I'm doing. But if you don't go, those opportunities of very degrees can't happen. Mm-hmm. They just can't happen. So, so to me, I, I, I now follow some pretty, pretty basics, you know, if I don't really, it's not in the heart or I'm not kind of like pumped up, uh, yeah, I don't – yeah, I know I'm not going to put in what should be required and I might go for easy opportunity like, yeah, a few hours with a couple of you – know, a young guy and his wife up there in the mountains. He's from WA. And he goes, where are you going? I'm going, I'm going nowhere. And I'm going to make sure the – I'm going to make sure the campfire and you got tea when you get back. <laughs> or I'll go and look for a hare. Why don't you go look for Samba? Don't want to. You're here to do that. I'm here to kind of like you know, help out or whatever. So, yeah, I just go. No, nah, it just wasn't in the wasn't in the bones, you know, uh, and all that. And you go. Now nah, I got to look for a hair or a rabbit or something like that, you know. Um, and you, which is still, you can have some great stuff. And and one of the other things that I, I struggle with a bit. It's all about big, you know. Uh, this is probably the wrong thing to say, but it's like slugging on the table. Get your slugs out, lads, you know, all that type of stuff. Mm, yeah. It's not about that. Definitely not. It's not about that, you know. Your trophy is whatever animal you take, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not about it. You go, this is the trophy. And this young fellow from WA, you know, he shot a, uh, a button spiker, you know. And I go, man, that's the best. We were dancing around, jump around, we kind of had a few scotches and all that type of stuff because – what you done, you come from Perth to the mountains and you mm-hmm. shot a wild Samba deer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, let's rejoice and all that type of stuff. Okay. So nice to not not nice to be in the zone with the boys and whatnot, but there shouldn't be any lesser you know, back padding uh for a hind of any species or whatever, whatever. Uh than there is if it's, if it's a big animal. And, and one of the biggest things with the, with the bow, what, what I absolutely love, we are the only hunting fraternity that you know, might give somebody a man hug when they shot a rabbit because you know, mm-hmm. you know, that they're not easy to shoot. You know? yeah. Yeah, and, and that's that's that, that's that thing that I reckon my love of it is, is that, the excitement and the sharing of the experience is is the greatest bond, or or, or that uh, you know if something's down, uh, and this was pointed out a few years ago, uh, we were hog deering and whatnot, and a guy from Cairns was down, and this this young kid from Perth, he, he shot a hog deer, blah, blah, blah. so anyway, we go right, we got two down, you got one down, you got one down, right, let's leave them, we do it in the morning. And this guy from Cairns was blown away that when we went looking for this young fella's deer, there was five of us. Everybody was there. One forward, two moving ferns, blah, 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 blah. And he just stood back and couldn't believe it. This everybody had gone, like he's only there for five days, gone, no, we're not hunting tomorrow. We're going to find your deer because your deer is our deer as well. Yeah, and definitely. that's that's the big thing. That's the big thing. Uh, and even there uh, are um, yeah. Last year, I was at the mountains of bloke, and we smack one, whatever, and they go right. He goes, what do I do? And I go nothing, nothing. We go back and we drink tea. You're not going to sleep. I'm going to sleep, and then we get up in the morning, and we we trail it, and we find it, and we did. But what was amazing? That was a probably the hardest trail I'd done. It was about 360 meters through the bush, and just going on on prints, on, on running marks, and we oh, had wow. 15 drops of blood, but we found it. And yeah. uh, and and is it because you go, uh, not being a big head or nothing, but you go, if you're there by yourself, you'd go, Ooh, you know, the brain brain has a fuse out, and oh, mm-hmm. I've been guilty of that myself, going, eh, and you need somebody to go, 
let's just do this. Let's do that. Calm down. Let's do this. That thought process. So, so those things become the sharing. Uh, and a week or so after I smacked that big one in a couple of uh, last year, year before, uh, you know, me mate Robbo's off and up the mountains, you know, we hang out a bit. Uh, he was there and I'd come home right over after a few days and then he'd, he'd smack one and me mate Russ rings and goes, oh, Robbo's gone down. That was at half past eight at night. I got, I left pretty well immediately. And was there a bit after midnight, curled up in my swag out the front of the shearing shed. He got up at half past five, whatever, and I go, morning. And he goes, what are you doing here? And I go, I thought you might need a hand. Now, we didn't find that deer, but we sure did look. And I knew that that extra mindset may be of assistance. And and I guess it's a three-hour drive, but you go, that's what you do. That's what you do. And... And that's the greatness and the bond and the camaraderie and all that 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 bow hunting brings. It brings a fellowship that is so powerful that few people really understand. And 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 like it's like the family, the extended family is just so amazing, you know. And you wouldn't have these people in your life. I have no idea what would have filled the void no idea but i'm so privileged to have such a cross section of truly decent decent people mm-hmm. who enjoy that ballistic spirit of everything associated with bow hunting everything everything mm-hmm. and the being and all that type of stuff and i just just respect it so well and respect those people who become part of that family, part of the sharing. And, and like uh, the, the other weekend I went, my Michael encouraged me to go to the meet and greet up at Wodonga. And it, it was a new experience because all these people were connected by Instagram and you go, Insta what? Insta what? Eh? Eh? Uh, and that you go, wow, what a great bunch of people. Can't meet them all. Kind of conversations with all of them, but the the ambience of that I think there was about 60, 65 people there or something. The ambience was so nice, so beautiful, joyous. No, there was no super slugging, nothing like that. There was just nobody had to. Prove nothing to nobody else or whatever, and nobody didn't care what you'd done. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest thing. We don't care what you've done, you know, blah, 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 blah. And you go, so, so that other so side of it is, is nice. It was really awakening to go the power of social media, which I'm totally, you know, uh, no comprehension about at all. Yeah. You know, yeah. I still use my fax machine and I've got a checkbook, okay, and a bank, <laughs> and, and, and a bank book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm pretty smart with a Visa card, but that's about it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um, it's definitely. I think it's opened up the ability to be able to connect social media. It's um, the same at the same time as it, it puts all of the pressures and whatever else on on young bow hunters, particularly, um, or I guess bow hunters in general. They they feel that pressure because it's only ever the good things that get shown on social media. At the same time, it also opens up this massive world of connection. Um, and realistically, like this podcast wouldn't be anything if it wasn't for social media. I started purely just by reaching out to people on social media um, because I, I was interested in bow hunting. I got into bow hunting. I didn't know anyone who bow hunted. So I just started reaching out to people who were bow hunters on Instagram. And that was essentially what got me started as a podcast. Here I am four years later with over a hundred hours worth of content, like the amount of time that you spent chasing hog deer, I was spent talking about bow hunting, <laughs> probably a lot more than that actually. But at the same time, um, it, it's just an interesting piece. And I think it's a, it's a powerful piece, but at the same time, I think we need to keep reminding each other that you don't need to let the pressures um, weigh you down because it's only a pressure because you're letting it be a pressure within the mindset of, of how you're carrying it. Um transitioning away from that a little bit and going more towards the the skinning side of things, but more so down the taxi dermy route. I believe that you've done a fair bit of taxi dermy yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, started 37 years ago. 
uh, whatnot, and then, uh, yeah, like dicked around and all that type of stuff, and then early in the piece in 87, uh, the guy I used to buy a few things off, he was going to South Africa, and so I brought his so-called uh, taxidermy supply business, which he'd only had for a bit over a year. So my learning curve was just off vertical. Uh, I only knew one other taxidermist in the country, <laughs> apart from this guy, and but I had a belief because there used to be a crowd who used to sell a bit of stuff, but it was, you know, not actually the greatest. And I believed that there was an opportunity to sell stuff, good stuff, with you know a degree of you know, credibility and honesty. You know. And so I built this little uh, like the taxidermy supplies, you know, from absolutely as good as nothing to a pretty busy little show. And uh, I then had was approached thirteen years ago and. And you know, and, and and Dennis Grundy and his wife, they they took it over and called it now Australian Taxidermy Spot. But the but in that, you're always doing taxidermy. And I used to do stuff, you know, people in the states that was through, you know, when I was skinning for this outfitter and ha, ah, yeah, a bit here and a bit there, and yeah, probably four or five different countries I've sent stuff to, all that type of stuff. And now I not so much retired, but uh, pick and choose. Uh, yeah, pretty select what I do, uh, and not so much who for. But early in the piece, you said something about you know how do you find this guy, and being me. Uh, and people go, how do I find you? And I go, well, do you know anybody I know? And they go, no. And I go, well, you. Probably won't find me. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, what's your Facebook page? I don't have one, mate. Uh, and all that type of stuff. Um, so plotted, plotted along and and used to kind of like have very basic little tuition courses for people who are interested and all that type of stuff. And even now, you know, somebody ring up and I go, depending on where they are, depending on like them. Mm-hmm. You know, all that stuff. I'll come down. I've been stooged a few times, but that's whatever. So, you know, that's just life. Uh, and, like, at this stage, at the moment, I got, like, a couple of ballistic scrub bulls here I've just done. And the last little buffalo for the year will go out. And I hadn't done stuff like that for for years, but I've absolutely loved it. So now it's only, you know, a few samber and, and a few og deer and a couple of chittle and a few red deer and whatnot. And, and you know, and I don't want, you know, uh, a heap of stuff at all. Mm. And like some people are way behind. But uh, I did a book on it, you know, long, long, because the only book you could buy was uh, old American books. And, you know, they, they had stuff in their recipes like arsenic, you know, and asbestos and whatnot. And you go, whoa, we're going to wrap a bird up in asbestos fibers, you know, and – all that stuff. So at that stage, there was – this is before the net, you know, like which is hard for, you know, uh, people with generation or two generations to blow. They go, what? What What? what was before the net? <laughs> Nothing, mate. Postage stamps, you know. <laughs> Post- <laughs> a yellow white pages and the postage stamps. Yeah? Uh, so there was nothing. And so I did this book on Australian game head taxidermy, you know, which was probably pretty gutsy, but – it was just because you go, well, there's an, I, I used to write it out freehand how to do stuff and post it to people. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I go, there's got to be a, it's got to be a smarter way to do this. <laughs> so I did that. And that was, uh, yeah, really, well, well you know, moderately successful because it's self published and all that type of stuff and da da da. But it, yeah, I went to a couple of unis and, you know, institutions and stuff like that, you know, as an educational tool. And you know, I sold out of it years ago. I Printed a thousand copies, and I see a while or a few years ago now, like you know, some of us once I'll put like a hundred bucks on you know, on Amazon or there you go, whatever it was. But but it was a starting point, yes. You know, you go, This is the basics, you can do this. This is the basic, basic, basics. It was a way 
to start and that whole thing of that, you know, you know sharing thing and you go, yeah, no, no big dharma, yeah, come in, blah, blah, whatever, 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 you know. Uh, so, and again, like I, 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 I will always do it until, you know, Play the wife comes out here and goes, oh, he hasn't been inside for a couple of days. You know? <laughs> you come out here and you know, the flies or might have fallen into a tan bath or something like that. But but part of it is, right, is remaining connected to people. Mm. The people who are part of part of what we do. Mm. You know, they're, they're, they're people of the bush, male and female. Uh, the people with the same interests, the love of animals and respect of animals, because that is part of why somebody does a head because they respect that. It's not to actually show it to Bob or whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's respect of stuff. And that connection with people is paramount to me, you know. And, and again, it's of all ages, you know, like I'm doing stuff that I did for the Grandparent now you're kind of doing stuff for their grandsons. You go, yeah, well, I've been here too long, you know. So <laughs> anyway. well, it's really, it's really an art form, right? Like to put together, uh, to recreate an animal. How, like I can't even imagine the process of that and how long it must take. And then, what are you referencing? Do you just reference the one photo that you get given? Is that kind of all you've got to work with? Well, no, not really. No, no, no. See, like there's, I got a catalog from the states here, and there is not an animal that you could name that i couldn't buy a body for right oh, wow so you could go oh, i want a semi-mature aardvark you know you, go, you want male you want male or female you know like what do you want uh or nothing there's nothing so you could go boom or you go uh i need a jaw set for a tyrannosaurus rex and they go yeah what well, male or female you know young one or big one yeah you know? uh mm. Anything you go bear claws, this like that, you know, or yeah, you know, it's just amazing. And that and the development of urethane foam mm. are no different than putting sights on a bow. Technology, yeah, wow. boom. Wow. So there's nothing. So you don't actually really even need reference photos because generally the bodies that are available now are that good. Uh, the you go, that is what a buffalo looks like. That's what a uh, boss tourist uh, scrubble looks like. Or that's what a boss, whatever the Brahmins are, looks like. Indicus. You go, that's what it looks like. I just buy that body. You know, so then it's a matter really of having, you know, uh, appropriate tanners and whatnot. And that's the hardest thing with a lot of stuff is is people who are uh, uh, very skilled in, in tanning or cape tanning, you know, because oh, it's wow. a different – Basic thing you can't do it all yourself and all mm. that type of stuff uh, without a problem. It's like, like I didn't like with a buffalo, like up there buffalo camp. I would spend six to eight hours shaving a buffalo cape down, right? So that one, it salts good. Uh, you reduce everything about hair slip, and you can lift it. You know. So you're over a beam for six to eight hours, just shaving uh, flesh off and uh, big scrub balls. Yeah, somewhere between eight and ten hours. That's just huh. raw. And then you go, boom, bang, away you go, and you know that that trophy will be fine. Uh, but then, so that that process uh, and, and, like, that whole thing that uh, the industry grew and then, and then turned into fashion, right, and artists. And I used to have a lot of artists come down. Right, Sydney, Melbourne, blah, 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 you know, and to try and mix match uh, art and taxidermy, you know, because it was sing. And then, so, and, and then that exploded like probably 15 years ago mm -hmm. uh, and became very vogue in fashion and galleries and all that type of stuff. And, you know, I've worked with eh, probably three, well, one in particular. Uh, famous Australian artists in creating creating stuff and whatnot, and that then leads you into a different direction because you then you go you can make this with them. And what I we I did stuff with a guy who was opening Fashion Week in New York. You know, oh, wow. I mean, has a long funny story, but anyway, Bill the Goat, Bill the Goat, <laughs> ends up in New York and then gets sold off and lives in Holland now. 
And he come from Cowra. How funny is that? Bill the goat. <laughs> uh, so he never thought he'd travel the world. So but I did, did him with this artist and whatnot. And we, you know, yeah, yeah, dicked around and all that type of stuff. So that, 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 that again, was a great journey, journey into, you know, an extended family. So, you know, you end up with, uh, you know, the Boeing family and then you got the you know, taxidermy family, you know, and then I do stuff with art and these artists and whatnot. So you got a, an art family as well. And then you got a theater family. I do a bit of theater and blah, 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 blah. So it all just goes nuts, you know? Definitely. <laughs> it does. It does. Anyway. So um, would you would you say that, like, is taxidermy still alive and thriving? Is it a dying breed? What Where is it at? No, no, it's huge, huge, mm-hmm. huge, huge industry. Uh, yeah, no, definitely not. Def- definitely not. Dying breed, uh, but no, no, no. It's uh, yeah, it, it, it's one of those things that just kept quietly growing, almost under underground movement that uh just keeps going and going, and it'll always be the next generation of people who is fascinated with the creation of that. How does it work? Mm-hmm. And and say the, the 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 amount of women and and, and young girls, you know, teenagers and whatnot, who just get drawn. And they're the ones who are, are super creative because they generally, I would say, there would be 90% of women who have morphed taxidermy into art to just a a world world class, uh, you know, art style. Like really mm-hmm. quite quite amazing. So no, no, no. And there's always a kid who wants to tan a rabbit skin or or get a floor rug done. Always, always. No different when I was a kid. You know, tan rabbit skins and sheep skins and stuff like that. And, you know, you go and get the bark off a wattle tree and chop it all up and boil it up and put a fox skin in it and stir it up. And and I still do that every couple of years. I'll, I'll get a nice fox skin and do it purely in the oldest method going. And that's just wattle bark tanning or bark tanning. And you extract the tannins out of the bark and there's no preserves and nothing and nothing, no chemicals, just the tannin from the bark. So that's pretty cool stuff, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. What um, what what sort of mistakes do you see people make when they're trying to tan their own hides? Mm, uh, well, generally, it say because there's those procedures. Is one is uh, field care. Uh, how long animals been down before you skin it? Uh, air temperature. Uh, whether you say say okay you've shot this fellow deer somewhere right you scun it out and you got the new uh the new austin martin and you go i'll just put on and get blood in the boot so i'll put that skin in a plastic bag mm-hmm. right so you drive home you get home you unpack your austin martin put it in the flash garage and yeah maybe that skin could have been heating in that bag mm-hmm. and then you sold it but it's probably too late Right, so that field care from death to skin to cool to salt is paramount. Once you've done those, bang, bang, bang. Because even on a say thirty-five degree day, right, you shoot something, whatever, you know, skin it out, stick it under the shade of a tree. Whoop, that thirty-seven point five degrees of the skin cools back down. Mm-hmm. So that's the primary, and then you get. The salt on it, way you go. Then you don't have to worry about it. salt it twice. La la la. So then, from that, then it depends what formula, whether it's Granny's old formula, or whether it's Bob's formula, or whether it's off a packet or whatever. Uh, and there's you know x amount of different types of you know chemical processes or whatever. But generally, it's this it's the field preparation that messes that up. is the most paramount. Is there a way that you do it without salting? Because a lot of the time I've actually, and I've taken it to two different taxidermists and not actually salted my my hides at all. I've just pretty much got them straight off the animal, folded them up, put them in the freezer and taken them to them cold. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They really yeah. like that as a process. Um, what, what, like obviously they're then going ahead and salting it or is, is salting something that has to happen? Yeah, it has to happen in the process. So, yeah, okay. And I've had stuff like that come in, capes and whatever, or somebody drop the skin off. Uh, but it still can be a problem because unless you've really cooled that skin down, right, normally you'd get it in the bush, you know, bang, you might leave it for a while, flap, 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 you know, then roll it up, boom, 
throw it in the freezer. But what can happen, the the inside, let's say, of the roll, mm. you know, could be still warm. Yeah. So by the time the outside freezes, yeah, it could take five hours or more because it's funny that the fur and skin happens to be a really good insulator. So <laughs> that, funny about that. Uh, so that, uh, it, you know, itself can be problematic, that everything could be all right on the outside, but the, the centre part will be still generating heat, you mm. know. Uh, and really in the person, you know, they'll thaw it out and see if it depends on the winter, you know, it could take three days to thaw, thaw you know, a skin out that's been rolled up or a cape. Uh, you got to keep opening and opening and opening and opening them, you know? And then, you know, uh, yeah, you can flash them and fix up whatever has been done and then you still got to solve them. You know, it's uh, one of those things that learn to do it, less problems or potential hassles down the line, you know. Mm. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like caving. Learn to cape out because – uh, like the place away at the mountains called the Wanagata Valley, and I know a couple of different blokes over the years have gone up. Three of them have gone up. Somebody shot a good stag on the first day, you know, and they've hiked in or whatever. And they go, Well, I got the stags, I gotta, sorry, boys, I'm out. So they all march back out carrying the stuff. But if they had known how to skin it, they wouldn't have had to do that, you know, and, and save it. Yeah, you, don't need, you don't need to carry a quarry full of salt or anything either. How much how much salt do you need for let's say a red cape? Uh red cape, uh, yeah, no less than say ten kilos for the first salt, you mm-hmm. know, another ten kilos for the second salt. Normally I kind of work say the red skins like up north, you know, a red deer camp. Uh I'll use a bag of salt, you know, on a skin on its two salts, you know? Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um, I think it's like all things within bow hunting. You, you need to practice it all. And so every new animal that you get down, skin it and do your process. But I would say start practicing as if you're trying to actually cape out and you, you'll just get more efficient with an animal. Yeah, yeah. Very first time I skun out an animal, it was not very clean. And then now yeah. that when I do it and I do it a bit more frequently, it's a lot easier and it all happens a lot faster. Um, and the process is really quite clean in general like it's very rarely that you'll nick the skin and have that little hole that you were punching t- 20 or 30 of them in the first skin you ever did <laughs> no no it's 100 percent. and i always had young fellows like yeah you know, they bring in a deer head okay this is the deal boys i'll show you how to do it next time i'll charge you so that then in saying that that that's encouraging them to have a go i said i don't Definitely. mind stitching up holes and all that i don't care if you cut it or nick it or whatever but have a crack. And if you shoot a hind or whatever, practice on the ears because the ears are crucial. You know, a mm. lot of people don't spend that time in turning ears inside out or doing the lips and the nose and all that. So I generally you, know, you have to do that most times. But and sometimes I had one come in recently. Yeah, that was a bit over a bucket and a quarter of excess meat that I took off the cape. Like, you know, wow. you could make – you know, lots of <laughs> lots of shoes out of it. Yeah, yeah. So that so that thing, you just go. No, just practice. Just practice because I don't care. And, and especially, I'm a bit fascinated now, especially with YouTube and that. That even in the bush, you should be able to Google how do I cape this deer, mm. and and it'll be showed. But but sometimes watching it, you know, and doing it, but it's just one of those things that uh, yeah, it takes it takes practice, like everything, and all that type of cape. Yeah, I'm definitely guilty of not practicing heads enough. That's kind of where my expertise definitely falls off the window very quickly. Um, and it's something that even just you saying it then was like, yeah, you're right. And I just need to start practicing with the ears and lips a little bit more. Yeah, but uh, and and it's like as bow hunters, sometimes sometimes we don't get the opportunity to practice because we have we, you know, we're kind of like you know, turning it quietly into vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. that, that that's that's a bit of a different game. Yeah. So yeah. But anyway, no, you do it whenever you can or you know, you just have a go. You go. It's not not rocket science. You're not inventing, you know, a nuclear warhead. You're just trying to get this skin off this deer head or whatever. <laughs> be. Some are more tri- some are trickier than others and all that, but but the process is still the same. Mm. You know, take take your time. La la la, you know, and over the years did lots of show and tells and whatnot, and we've got a you know archery thing in a couple of weeks, 
yeah, a bit of a rendezvous and yeah, we'll do a little bit of that as well because there's always somebody new who who has never seen it or or, or doesn't you know doesn't know that it's really part of the of the of the game. It should nearly be a licensing requirement for all hunters and that to go, yeah, I gotta, you know, I gotta know how to do this. But anyway, doesn't yeah. matter. Um, we move on. So, something that you you made very clear is that you've you've hunted with a lot of people and you've shared hunting and bow hunting with a lot of people, especially young individuals. What's what's something that you always try to part on people, um, especially if they're very new to bow hunting, whether it's their first time or their first year or their first three years of bow hunting. What are what do you think are some of like the biggest lessons that you try to part with them when you get the experience or the opportunity to be with them out in the bush? Uh, I was asked that uh, the other weekend up at Donga. Um, what what uh, advice would you give me? This guy was pretty new to the game. Now, it's really quite a problematic question because you go, hmm, I don't really know. Uh, Very open-ended. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Pandora's box of answers. But really, <laughs> it was more so be patient. Don't get disheartened be uh, as efficient and as, and as proficient as you can uh, with your bow. Uh, try not to be in a hurry. Wait for that shot. And really, it's just that it can be. And hang around. And be strong. Just don't hang around with uh, two heads because – yeah, if it hits the fan, you'll be just covered in it. And you'll be another poo head. Uh, <laughs> hang around, hang around with people that play on the same page. Mm. Uh, yeah, who, who know what they're doing and all that type of stuff. And and probably the biggest thing is, is I go go to your local club. You know, people go, oh, you know, some people go, oh, I don't like clubs and all that policies or politics, or whatever. I go, no, no, no. The, the, the clubs generally have you know, are made up of people who are so passionate about the equipment. They, they mightn't be great bowmanners and they mightn't be interested in bowing, but they're interested in archery. And if your equipment is super tuned, uh, well, then that's just, you know, one, you know, niche in the three or four niches you need to be uh, proficient in the bush with your bow and arrow. Yeah. You know, it's prominent, you know. So, so that really is go to a local club, meet the people who know and are passionate about what they're doing. And from there, you know, away you go. Spend time in the bush by yourself. Don't be afraid to ask, but be careful how you ask, you know. Mm. Don't, yeah. don't demand. Yeah. Don't demand. And, yeah. and all that big, type of stuff. a big thing, right? So, oh, no, uh, you're not, you're not an entitled thing. human, so don't, don't act like it. No, 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 that's right. And, and, and see, one of the differences is like, when when we first started, so Michael was about twelve or th- maybe thirteen. We went to South Australia on a paid property, right? so that's a long time ago now. Uh and they hadn't really been around, and 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 so the older guys they were pretty opposed to paying because they used to not pay. Blah 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 blah. Uh but the great thing now. You know, there's, there's courses like I met some guys from Sydney and, 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 and they do courses and whatnot up in Liverpool or New England or whatever. So mm-hmm. even if you don't really know anybody, there's places that you can that advertise or whatever where you can go. And even there's a guy I uh, met up at Reddy Camp a couple of years ago, uh, Johnny Lowe from Sydney, and he was a bit of a newcomer and he came to Red Deer Camp. And we had a great time, and he admitted himself he was a bit naive with staff. And you go, no, they're not, they're not great, bro. Broadheads or this, 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 this. And yeah, we had some great times. And then last year he was back again, you know, and he was the king of the table, and it was really a beautiful thing. And and so there are places where you can go, even if you don't know, you can go where that wasn't necessarily around years and years and years and years ago. Now, 50 years ago, I, my brother and I paid five bucks at Ivanhoe in New South Wales to go on this property, right, for as long as we wanted, 
five bucks. <laughs> yeah, it was a huge swamp. We never went back. Well, I don't know why we didn't, but you know, Ivanhoe was a million miles away anyway in a Volkswagen. Uh, but yeah, five bucks, as long as you stay, you know, we go, we didn't charge you, go, oh, yeah, five bucks, you know, <laughs> you go, five bucks. How funny is that? Yeah. That's but, crazy. <laughs> uh, and that was 50 years ago. So that was the very beginning when there was that recognized. But I, I think it's, I think it's good because uh, if you want to, I think it was Aldo Leupold or one of them wise people said something. If you put a price on an animal's head, you guarantee it's survival. Yeah. You know? So, and that's like, <laughs> yeah. You know, no, you do. Yeah, you do. You do. Yeah. You know, you want to like on the hog deer. You know, sometimes it's a trophy fee of a grand or two grand or whatever, whatever, whatever. But that person, or even more, that person on that property is going to go. I can make whatever a year. I'm done to do a thing off that animal. Same as a chittle deer. Same as a buffalo. Same as scrub bulls or whatever, whatever. You go boom. No, we'll let them big fellas go because some hunter will come along and pay. So it has a mega, mega, mega thing uh, to do. It's not often looked at that you go, this is the deal with price on animals that actually, yeah, you're not just going to be shot because actually, hmm, don't have to do nothing and I can make some money off you or whatever, whether it be right or wrong, doesn't matter. That's how it is, right? Yeah, definitely. So last question to um, wrap up with. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation, but last last one for the show today yeah. um, would be in the situation where you have exhausted yourself, you've exhausted all avenues of the hunt and you're feeling nice and miserable in the, the, the downfall of the day. What is your go-to for when you don't feel like you've got anything left? in regards to you're out in the bush, you're like, where the heck are they? Why are they not here? They should be here. I've done everything that I feel that I should be doing. What What's your go-to in that situation? Okay. All right. Okay. It's two things. Uh, are you seriously fatigued? Are you kind of like crawling? Uh, is your throat burning? Because no, no, no. I'm also, okay. Right. Like, yeah. Well, okay. You're no, no, right. down no, on yourself okay. because you've tried no. everything and it's not working. Yeah, you tried everything, but you've got plenty of water in your pack and you you got a pocket full of Kit Kat, so, so life is good. This is this is pretty cool. Learned this from a guy on, on Melville Island years ago. You know, nothing here. He goes, we go over the next hill. Oh, and you go, God damn it. You know, like, man, I'm finished with these hills. Well, we go to the next one. We'll go to the next floodplain. And you go, come on, you know. That's what I learned from him. Nothing here. Let's go to the next hill. Yeah. Let's go to the next hill. Let's go to the next hill. Let's look in the next gully. Let's look in the next gully. Keep creating opportunity yeah I love that's it. what it is so yeah you go to the next one and you go i don't want to go to the next hill but I go, we're going to the next hill <laughs> shit right right yeah you know, there's nothing here again i got the next gully <clears throat> okay next flood plane <clears throat> that's that's it now even like with that like that okay, go out fox whistling right so i have my own little you know stupid laws of fox whistling right so <laughs> right don't get don't get despondent on the first one. Nothing come in. Second yeah. one, nothing come in. And you might walk a kilometer. You go, nothing come in. Nothing come in. I go, I will whistle one in within 15, say, whistling stands, you know, right? So you go from there to there to there to there to there to there, and you might drive another couple of kilometers. And, you go, there's a, yeah, da, 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 da. and all the time I'm going, 11. Oh, I'm going to get one within 15 whistles. And usually I do nine times out of 10, right? And even yeah, nine and a half times out of 10, I'll bring one in within that 15 whistles. So that's my go-go when you're out in the bush or, you know, I go down the river and sheep country and whatnot and I go, oh, good, you know, here we go again. You know, walk across this paddock, walk across this paddock, walk across this paddock, right? And you don't cheat by doing little, little, little whistles. <laughs> so, so, yeah, 15 proper whistling stands that you'd set up going, right, okay, we're here. Nothing, boom, go again, go again. So that's mine with whistling. And in the bush, it's generally the next gully, right? Or, or you know, up a creek, it's the next bend. And like years ago with burrows, like we we're up in the Gulf, like it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. We were pretty hot. It was pretty horrible. We had a couple of fellas, you know, it was on a guided thing. And they were pretty dudded. And I was a little bit, you know, out of salts with a few things. And I go, right, we're going. This is what we're doing. 
And it's like horrible. It's just like burning. And I said to Burroughs, right, we keep going. We keep going. This place going, no, 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 no. And he, he had to be a bit quiet anyway. It was his show, but you know, anyway. Anyway, I go, right, we go to the next bend. And Burroughs goes, give it up. <laughs> give it up, you know. And I go, we'll get one within 350 metres. Well, there was a bit more. There'll be another drop of water. Yeah, we'll get. Anyway, bingo, you know, 360 metres. Ah, there's a little pond. There's a couple of hogs. Anyway, they, they disappeared with it. I go, another 200 metres, another 200 metres. I'm just going to go, I'm going to, I got I won't be here next week, you know. And you go, got to keep going. Anyway, kind of nearly wore myself out as well. But she was a very long, long, tedious walk back. But it's about, say, for a pick up a creek, next bend, next bend. You know, fellow deer, next ridge. Red deer, they might be roaring in the next gully. Samba deer, uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, so, <laughs> not sure. You know, pigs, next creek, what up? Fox, another 15 whistles. Rabbits, yeah, where are they today? You know, but don't matter. But that is that, to me, that's what, you know, gets me is that, uh, uh, you know, like up there in the territory, you know, I got to keep going. I got another hour or I'll go another 10 minutes. And 10 minutes is not very long, but you can cover so much country you know, in 10 minutes. And even in the mountains, you go, mm, well, am I going to go over there? And I'll look at me and watch and go, I'll be there in eight minutes. And you're surprised if you're kind of cranking yourself against your watch, you know, you can cover down that, up that, round that side, over the next one in that, like, maybe last 15 minutes of daylight or whatever. And years ago, right, Burroughs and I are up, up in a goal, right? So we're in this sand hill country, it is. It is just atrocious the heat. So, and I go, they might be over there. So we're going to cut across this big plain, get to this bit of sand hill where these pandanas was. Right. And anyway, it was horrible. It was just like 42, 45, whatever. It's just burning. You know? And all I could visualize, right, was the uh, guys on the death camp walk, you know, Japanese you know, prisons of the Second World War, the, de the death mm, walk, you know, and yeah. like, boom. And I go, this is your deal. Boom, 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 boom. Think of those people. Think of those people. Think of those mm -hmm. people. Time I got over there, wasn't too bad. Then it was a real bit of a battle because I couldn't think of anything on the way. But, anyway, <laughs> but, but that's that's the drive is you go, if you kind of click into a different focus, you go to do here or do there. But that definitely that next hill, next bend, I can be there in 10 minutes because 10 minutes is nothing. But if you went, I'm going to walk for another hour, yeah, you only got to probably go 10 minutes, you know, or another five minutes, another five minutes. And it can be, it can be a bit tricky because uh, you can, that five minutes can lead to another five minutes, da, 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 and then you still got to walk back or whatever, you know. So that's basically that, that, those nuts and bolts for me anyway. I don't know what everybody else does, but, you know, yeah, <clears throat> change your focus, whatever, and go, right, okay. Uh, you really want to do this today or not? And that's often the big one. You go, mm, no, not really. I go, that's why a tree stand and ground blind for Sam Oh, well, much better. <laughs> anyway. no, I, I really like that. And I think it, it just goes back to the point that we talked about of resilience building. It really does. And it's the yeah. same sort of thing. Like I've been a fitness coach for a lot of my life. And that was a lot of the stuff that I'd always tell people, like right when you want to put the bar down, do two or three more reps. And that will just make you that much better each time. We can go for a run, look at the next um, the next power pole and just say, I just yeah. need to run to that point. And then yeah. we get to that point and they're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. I can run to the next yeah. one. I think no, the exact exactly. same exact same thing happens for exact the same. team. It's yeah, really, yeah. Like yeah. you said, it's building opportunities, building resistance. I'm yeah. oh, sorry, resilience because – yeah. The more that you do that, the easier it becomes. The next time you're out in the bush, you're like, oh, you know what? I've only got three days of this, and I'm super excited to use every little bit of that three days. Oh, yeah, and, and that, and see, even, and I think the best thing you can do for yourself is go somewhere and do the alone business, you know, mm -hmm. and you go, boom, that really is a challenge in itself uh, with three days or four days. And people who do it for longer than that, I tip my hat because you go, I know it's hard yakka, even because there's never a reason to come back to camp because there's only the ants to talk to. That's all that's there. <laughs> Nothing. It's just ants. You yeah. know? There might be seven species I was years ago. You know, I was at this spot. You know, 
I go, boom, seven species of ants. You go, why do I know? Because they're crawling over and bite me, so I didn't, no point to come back to camp because the ants are going to get me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you stay in the bush. Uh, yeah, and that thing about, hmm, yeah. But, you, but anyway, that, that's, 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 that's what I do. Yeah, you know, and you kind of go, and if you can pass that on a little bit, you go, this is the deal. And, you know, Adam Clements, I do a fair bit with him. He's a great guy. And I said that about the 15 things. He abides by his 15 fox whistles, you know. Boom, I'll keep going. I've got to do 15. I've got to do 15. One will come in. So it does keep you going and all that type of stuff. Yeah. No, I really pretty, love it. Pretty cool. And David, I want to say thank you because it's been a really insightful conversation. It's been really great. I've really enjoyed it. And I know the listeners are going to really like it. As you're not on social media, what I will do is <laughs> reference people to go to your son's page instead and they can, <laughs> uh, they can keep up with some of your activities there. <laughs> But is there is there any books available still? Any of your books in general? I know you said you'd sold out the taxidermy one, but what about yeah, the bow hunting? Yeah, yeah, I got the bow hunting ones available. And, and and years ago I did did a kids book associated with hunting. It's called no the Frog Bear The Frog Bear and Mr. Sparrow, a story of adventure hunting the outdoors and arrows. Uh and it was like I self-published that. Uh it's like 10,000 word kid story uh, in 10 chapters. My sister did the illustrations and all that type of, I'll get Michael to uh, put some pictures up on his Instagram thing or, or, or whatever he's got. Definitely. Yeah. You can, uh, uh, because that, stuff. that'd be great. Yeah. And that the education department paid me for, I like it. It was totally non-profitable thing. Uh, but it was about an idea when my kids were going to school, there was a great surge of uh, new teachers who were Andy hunting, World Wildlife, all that type of stuff, Peter. You know, and so their influence was quite uh, obvious at, at state school level. Mm. And so I thought if the uh, slip, slop, slap, you know, sunscreen, big norm, pick up your rubbish, they, they, all those things have started at uh, uh, state school level. You know? And I go, hmm, could you do that, you know, with, with hunting or whatever? Anyway. It took a few years and it was quite an accidental way it all evolved. And so I did it. And because of the expense and all that type of stuff, uh, and I knew nobody, no, 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 kids book publisher, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever, do that. Uh, and, but it had some really nice kind of reviews and, and it was about, it's okay to be different. And, and probably the nuts and bolts was that it was all about three friends like me, Mr. Sparrow, Greg Hansford, the frog, right, and Mark Burroughs, the bear, right, from different backgrounds. We were all drawn together by the common denominator of bows and arrows, right? Yeah, yeah. And from that, we then went on this huge, huge adventure right to the hot north lands, you know, and along the way we meet Mr. Bunter, the elephant hunter, right, who is actually Billy Baker, right, and and I used, I used to send uh, things to him, uh, yeah, letters, and I'd write Bill Bunter, the elephant hunter, P.O. Box, or whatever it was, your poon, you know. So, so you bring in this character, right, now he was a bit crazy, but, because we'd been told to visit him by this other person. So he immediately became a friend, right? So it's like, you know, if I introduce you to one of my friends, you're automatically by default his friend, right? Yeah. Period. Yeah. You've got no options, right? So this was this about, and even McComsky, you know, up in Cairns, you know, blah, 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 blah. So it was all these real people disguised as, as characters that the frog bear and sparrow travel all over the country and have these adventures and are the heroes in the end of the day, la, 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 la. So, uh, and, and, and some kids, a teacher in Darwin, she was showing her, her, her students who were uh, like you know, troubled kids, you know, 10 to 15 or 13 or something like that. And anyway, she read this book to them, which she thought might have been too old. And they said, no, 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 miss, we want to you know, hear the rest. And anyway, at the end, she said, what was this about? And they all said, it's okay to be different. I didn't even see that. Mm. How powerful was that? So from an idea, you know, and, 
you go, it's, it's spread. And, and, and there's, there's that old kids in Stratford who call me Mr. Sparrow, you know, cheeky little brats, but <laughs> like, hey, Mr. Sparrow. Anyway, so that's how things can develop from, from, my, from my ideas. And you go, how can I try and do something? Uh, and I know some kids got bows and arrows for Christmas because of that little book. Whether they pursued it, incredible. I don't care. But they're they're out there, you know. Uh, yeah, doing stuff. So so that was so I'll I'll get Michael to do whatever he does on his device. And, <laughs> so, Put some references so, up. Yeah, 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 yeah. All 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 easy. So there's uh. Yeah, there's a few of them frog bears and there's a few bowing ones and all that type of stuff. So anyway, but but Tim kind of like up at this thing up at Donga, you know, uh, I had some with me, you know, and give some away or whatnot. And, and, you know, you're hesitant, especially who uh, be up front, you know, or go, uh, look at me, this is me book. You go, because people go, well, I don't give a shit, mate. All right. Uh, or whatever, or you're a blowhard, or whatever. So sometimes it's hard to self-promote. That's a word, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Not very good at that, you know. And uh, all that type of stuff. You know. Anyway, write me a letter. I, stick I think, a stamp on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, to be honest, in Australia, we've been uh, we've almost had that bashed out of us, right? Self-promotion. You, you get it bashed out of you by tall poppy. And absolutely I mean, it's no, no, not a thing to be very uh no, no. proud and excited for your friends and family when they're doing incredibly well right so no, that's dead that's something that uh, bow hunting actually does very well is congratulating each other when something good does happen when it absolutely happens, you know, everyone gets behind you it's like you said before they'll give each other a big big man hug and i think that's something that's yeah, really, man, really good about it right um, I, I have kissed two people i have kissed two men right? but <laughs> it was in the excitement and i go so <laughs> Now, this is a hunting kisses. There's nothing sexual. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I can understand the excitement, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think um I think the self-promotion thing, uh, I think realistically, it's something you can be we can all be better at is um congratulating each other on extra successes outside of bow hunting as well, because there's a lot that goes on, especially you look at some of the, the businesses in, in Australia and what they're doing to move forward um, with bow hunting in particular, like there's some amazing things going on. And I think uh, that tall poppy thing, it, it's unfortunately it's something that hasn't served us very well here in Australia. No, no that's hundred percent correct. And, and that's why there's a lot more millionaires in America because mm-hmm. they uh, get behind people uh, where we're, you know, if you do, Interesting fact, well, from my my perspective, that years ago with a sporting shooter and all that type of stuff, it seemed to me that if an author or a contributor uh, wrote, you know, had one, two, three, four, five articles published, oh, yeah, he's a bit of like hero, seven in a row. Anyway, you get out the sickle and tie and start chopping him down and you go, oh, he's just a dickhead or something like that. And you go, what? What? Why do people do that? But that's exactly 100% correct. Self-promotion and all that type of stuff. And sometimes it's just nice to poke along doing your own stuff, you know, and yeah. and all that type of cape. It, re- it really is. Very nice. Anyway. Man. Cool. Well, mate, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. This has been a really cool conversation. Uh, it's been nice to get to know you, definitely. Dude, thank you very much. Look after yourself. Power, power to the spirit. Here we exactly. go. I love it. Bye. Thank you, mate. That was great. <laughs> I mean, that that went on for a while. Didn't... I actually didn't check it, but it must have been uh, well, we must have been like an hour and a half, hour four. Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. <laughs> it 